Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances of the Sri Prabhupada. Today we are, we are fortunate to have His Grace Govardhan Adas to join us. Prabhu is a GBC member looking after Southern Africa. He's a BBT trustee and a co-director for the Global uh, Property Office. Um, Prabhu is also um, a member of the newly formed Global Health Committee. And he serves as the director and chairman for the Back to Godhead magazine board. In the past, he served as a Cold Temple president, regional secretary, and national secretary. He holds a master's and doctoral degree in business administration and is affiliated with the Alfred Ford School of Management MBA program in Radhadesh. Hare Krishna Prabhu, welcome. Uh, please, uh, if I must start anything, please, folks, please, you can add on some information. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Now you've added on too much there, Prabhuji. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so you'll tell me when we should begin. Or? Yeah, Prabhu, we can please start, Prabhu. It's we'll be a hand over to you. Okay. Hare Krishna. Welcome. All right. So let's chant some pranam prayers. Om Jnana Timirandasya Gyananjanan Chalakaya Chakshuran Militam Jena Tasmai Shri Guruve Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Stapitam Jena Bhutale Shvayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadati Shwapadantikam He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Rishabhanu Shrute Devi Pranamami Hari Priya Vanchakalpataru Vyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyavarcha Patitanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Adeta Gadadha Shivashadi Bhura Bhakta Rinda Ajana Lambita Bhuja Kanaka Vadato Shankirtanika Pitaro Kamalaya Taksho Vishwambaro Dijavaro Yoga Dharma Palo Vande Jagat Priya Karo Karuna Ravataro Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare so dear devotees, Hare Krishna, please accept my prostrated obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. It's really lovely to be with you this evening. Thank you so much for having me. So I was asked to say something about Bhagavad Gita being Lord Krishna's personal words. What I'm going to do is say something for about maybe 20 or 25 minutes. And then we can have a bit of a discussion. We have Shriva Pandit Prabhu here with us, I think. And Shiva Pandit Prabhu answer your questions. And um, any doubt or anything you any, any concern or anything you've heard that you're not clear about in Bhagavad Gita, we could have that discussion. So you could take some time to formulate your questions. Uh, we'll together just speak for not more than 25 minutes, maybe half an hour max. Is that okay? Prabhuji? Yeah. Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu, you're welcome, so, Prabhu Hare Krishna. Yes. So on the 14th of December, in a matter of time, what is that, two weeks time from today, the world will observe Gita Jayanti. That's the day when Bhagavad Gita was spoken. Now, as you know, from the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, 
it was spoken something like 120 million, 400,000 years ago. Srila Prabhupada does a very accurate calculation based on the Manus, etc. So, and Prabhupada says it's been in human society for at least 2 million years. Now, I don't know about you, but for myself, for all the body of knowledge in the world, there's hardly anything that we can say has been 2 million years in existence. Yet, the Bhagavad Gita is still very relevant today. It's very sacred. It uplifts our consciousness. It gives us uh, transcendental knowledge. And it's Lord Krishna's personal words. Of that 700 some odd verses, Krishna has spoken more than 570 of those words are Krishna's personal words. So in a sense, Bhagavad Gita is a transcendental navigation guide because it talks about life, uh, it talks us how to travel through life and how to finish life and how to safely reach the divine destination on the other side in the shortest possible time. Like we have confidence in an electronic GPS, right? Uh, even if we are lost. So we are lost in this material world. And Bhagavad Gita, this will, Krishna's words are the sound on that transcendental navigation system. So undoubtedly, Bhagavad Gita it pricks the mind, the consciousness of man, because it's a very deep book, because it points to our real identity, our role in the world, what we are meant to be doing here, and in particular, the transient nature of existence. Krishna is so emphatic. In chapter two, he gives such glorious information about this transient nature of this world. And ultimately, Krishna is telling Arjuna, my dear Arjuna, your qualification for receiving this message from me today is because you are my friend. You are my devotee. Not that you are a yogi or a teacher or an academic or some learned person. No, Arjuna, you are, because you are my friend and my devotee. So this is the fundamental basis fundamental approach to Bhagavad Gita. That's the consciousness with which we, we approach it. So as my devotee Krishna says, you will understand this transcendental mystery, this transcendental science, Arjuna. Evam parampara praptam. In the fourth chapter, you read those verses where Krishna is saying that this truth can only be understood by those who are coming in a disciplic succession. Disciplic succession means there's a line of teachers starting off from Lord Krishna himself coming down all the way through it, parampara. So Srila Prabhupada was a teacher in one of these four authorized disciplic successions. So Srila Prabhupada's position is therefore very unique, extremely unique. So the Gita is like a, a family secret that we hear. It's a family secret carefully handed down through many generations uh, from Lord Krishna to Lord Brahma all the way down. It's like you take a ripe mango fruit from a tree, you're very careful how you hand over the, the fruit to somebody receiving it. So in the same way, Bhagavad Gita has been transmitted. If you see the longest chapter of Bhagavad Gita, which is chapter 18, you know Bhagavad Gita is finished in chapter 17. 18 is really a summary. There Sanjaya, who was the transcendental narrator of Bhagavad Gita, he had the special boon from Vyasadeva uh, that he was able to see what's going on on the battlefield and know everything that's going on. He was even able to know the minds of all those warriors on the battlefield. So he was, he was struck with wonder at the end in the 18th chapter, he's saying this verse, um, Sanjay is he's rejoicing, he's thrilled after having heard what Krishna has just said. And at every moment, um, as the Gita concludes, um, Sanjay makes the statement, Yatra Yogeshvara Krishna, Yatra Parthu Danurdaya. Tatra Shri Vijaya Bhutir, Dhruva Nitir Matir Mama. That he says that wherever there's Krishna and wherever there is Arjuna, wherever there's Krishna and wherever there's Arjuna, four things would happen. There would always be opulence. There would always be victory. There would always be power and there would always be morality. Now, these are the things human beings like you and I are very much keen uh, to have, you know, spiritual opulence, spiritual victory, spiritual power, and morality. So Sanjaya is making this bold declaration, the end of the 18th chapter. So the Bhagavad Gita is not like some ordinary book, which you can buy at a bookstore and written by a mundane author. No, Say it's bye. Lord Krishna's own potency of knowledge, by which he enlightens the fallen souls. And one who studies the Gita therefore experiences a direct, association with Krishna. 
Now, one who hears properly, you know, he becomes Krishna conscious. There's no doubt about it. He can see Krishna in everything around him. Therefore, his life becomes uh, his life becomes exciting and wondrous at every step because he understands that ecosystem within which he's living. The details of that ecosystem is given by the Supreme Lord in the pages of Bhagavad Gita. What happens in this world and how it all works. So when one is Krishna conscious, one is Krishna conscious, he appreciates Lord Krishna's supreme, divine, transcendental position as a supreme shelter of everything. So it is Krishna's will that is supreme. Therefore, the devotee, by surrendering to that will of Krishna, he will only find victory and never find defeat or dejection. Now, you know, great teachers in the past have commented on Krishna's words. Baladev Vidya Bhushan was a very great scholar. He said that the Gita is the supreme truth. And he laments, you know, out of his humility, that attaining the fulfillment uh, of all his desires, he is immersed himself in the milk ocean of the Gita. That's what he says in the milk ocean of the Gita, but not able to lift the jewel of the wonderful meanings of, out of the ocean, although I have understood them to some degree. So in the same way, of course, Bala David Yubushan is a great Acharya. These are just his words of humility. When we read it, we may also to some degree understand, we cannot totally understand everything, but you can have a fair grip of the concepts and designs that Krishna is presenting. But this humility is the mood in which to approach the pages of Bhagavad Gita. Even Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, who I think comes 17 online after Lord Chaitanya, uh, you know, he says that Krishna's words have lighted up my heart, warmed up my heart. So just as the com contamination of the body is washed when you have a shower, similarly by bathing in the water of Bhagavad Gita, even once it said that the contamination of material existence can be cleared. So in particular, the structure of the Bhagavad Gita, a conversation, it's set in a very unique background. Krishna is about 90 years old. This is a battlefield. Uh, later on, when Krishna is about 125, ready to leave the world, uh, he will speak the Uddhava Gita, another Gita, to Uddhava, who is also his very close friend. Like Arjuna, is his very close friend. Yet Krishna is speaking for about 45 minutes. Uh, in his conversation with Uruva, he's speaking 23 chapters, and that's all recorded in the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. There's over a thousand verses. So the commentary by Vishwana Chakravati Thakur on the Uruva Gita, uh, this purport and chapter summary given by Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati, if you ever have time, it's a wonderful and a very beautiful read. But many people, scholars, persons who are not familiar with the devotional line they find the truths in Bhagavad Gita to be very contradictory. And let me just spend some time in this because uh, you know, there are 600 versions of Bhagavad Gita out there in the world. And to, uh, to understand the devotional side of it and appreciate what Srila Prabhupada has actually gave the world, we need to understand a little bit of their argument and then deal with it through, through the eyes of Shastra. So people who have read have reported that they're either very confused whether this book is an inscrutable wisdom, source of wisdom, or it's a book of contradictory truths. After all, as I said, it's a war dialogue. Can you imagine? The conch has been blown, the armies have come on both sides, and Arjuna says, I will not fight. So Krishna now has to convince Arjuna to do his duty. So is it a glorification of war? Or is, it a, is it a treatise or non-violence? Should it be taken allegorically or literally. So Srila Prabhupada, he removed all these doubts, all these doubts. Uh, and his Bhagavad Gita is distinguished from any other version of Bhagavad Gita on the planet because Srila Prabhupada called his Bhagavad Gita as it is. So very significant, these three words, as it is, because it had never been done before with the title of a scripture. Sacred text could be changed, but Prabhupada did it here because you saw the necessity, of the, you know, there's so many persons of so many uh, uh, interpretations of Bhagavad Gita and what Krishna's words actually mean. So Srila Prabhupada's translation is honest. Uh, it's an explanation, you know, it gives literal explanations and it gives the essential message according to each text. So because he's coming in the line of Vaishnava teachers, Vaishnava thoughts, you know, one commentator was saying that Krishna is not physically speaking to Arjuna. Hare Krishna. One commentator is saying that Krishna is not directly speaking to Arjuna. This is all the simulation that's going on. 
But it's not Krishna we need to surrender to. We, we surrender to something else. But this is not what the 18th chapter, which is a concluding chapter where Krishna is summarizing what Krishna is saying there. You know, technically, as I said, Bhagavad Gita is completed in the 17th chapter. But in the 18th chapter, which is the longest chapter in the whole of the Gita, in that verse, I think it's 75, he says, Krishna shakshat kata yata swayam. That Krishna was directly shakshat. He was right in front of Arjuna. He was preaching personally to Arjuna. He could see the expression on Arjuna's face and the fear. And it's not some imagination or simulation like that. So some of these scholars, they criticize Srila Prabhupada that Srila Prabhupada has reduced everything in the Gita to devotion, to bhakti. Even when there's no devotion <laughs> in, in the translation, uh, Srila Prabhupada directly references bhakti. So scholars like, you may be familiar with these scholars if you, you know, if you read Bhagavad Gita a few times, a, uh, and, and persons who've commented on Bhagavad Gita, A.L. Herman, for example, he says that Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita is devotionally biased. That's the word he uses. Biased translation. Srila Prabhupada interprets the passages to give it a bhakti flavor. Even uh, in India, persons like Hemraj, you know, or in the West, Kalawar, say that Srila Prabhupada made a mockery of this venerable uh, Hindu document. That Srila Prabhupada over overemphasized bhakti that conceals what the text is actually saying. And they cite some examples, like you look at chapter six, verses 11 to 12. Uh, but Srila Prabhupada in preserving Krishna's own words as the absolute truth, as a pure devotee of Krishna, he's followed faithfully the line that he was coming on. You know, he restored the spiritual integrity. And what's the proof of that? You know, in Sanskrit, there's a word called hetu. Hetu means uh, the cause of. So I see, I see smoke on the mountain and I can conclude that there must be a fire there. So in the same way, there's evidence that if you look at the Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, it's the only Gita that has made people devotees in the Western world, in the millions. So let's examine this just a little closer so we have a good grip on it. These persons are saying that Srila Prabhupada had laid in the whole Bhagavad Gita with aspects of bhakti when Krishna is speaking about karma and gyan and the yoga ladder, etc. Now, there's, there's a term, if, you, if it is a term in the Madhurya Kadambini, which is authored by Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, where he talks about sattvika bhakta, sattvika bhakta, sattvika bhakti, um, which is a limb of gyan. Right? An example is given in the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam, not to, come, not to become too technical, but just to illustrate the point. It says that although one endeavors with mystic yoga, one does charity, one does uh, homa sacrifice, vows, austerity, sacrifices, all these good things, studies the Vedas, still one cannot achieve bhakti. That's what's said in that verse, 11, 12, 9, if you want to ch check it out. Bhakti does not come from this. Bhakti does not come from austerity and charity and all of this stuff. These things are rejected as a cause of bhakti because bhakti is the cause of bhakti. Bhakti has got the same surupa as Krishna. It's non-different to Krishna. Right? But elsewhere in the Bhagavatam, like in the 10th canto, you'll read in that 47th chapter, 24th verse, it says that bhakti unto Krishna is attained by charity, by vows, austerity, japa, fire sacrifice, controlling one's senses. Now, how do you understand and reconcile these two statements? Dana, Vrata, Tapo, Homa, and Japa. In one place in the Bhagavatam, it's saying that bhakti, uh, these things have no influence on bhakti. In the other place, it's saying that it has. So it can be very confusing. So Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, he refers here to a thing called Sattvika Bhakti, which is the Anga of Gyan. Now, Anga means like a part of, Angi means like, Angi is my body but my hand is part of my body. So Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur says that, um, that, the, 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 that these things are the anga of gyan, these austerities, it is not the anga of bhakti. And Kapil Bhagavan, if you read Kapila's pastimes, uh, he says, if you do dan, or japa for liberation, then that is sattvika bhakti because the goal is not pure devotion. The goal is something else. So you can chant, you know, you can chant names of Vishnu. You can do kirtan, 
But the, the whole objective for these sattvic personalities is that they are looking for liberation. So it's sattvic bhakti. It's important to note that pure bhakti or pure devotion can only come by the association of the devotee, sadhu, sangha. So we are not seeing this person doing sattvic bhakti as a devotee of Krishna because his objective, although doing the same thing, appears to be doing the same thing, his objective is different. His, his objective is self-benefit. This person wants to become a bhakta. If he wants to become a devotee, he has to. is a ritualistic activity. His performance of sacrifice is ritualistic. And you, as you know, uh, ritualistic, to look at things ritualistic is one of the offenses of the holy name. So the bhakta who is one who is understanding the difference between karma and bhakti. Remember what I'm trying to illustrate to you is Srila Prabhupada's position on bhakti in the pages of Bhagavad Gita. And I'll be referring to Bhakti Sandarbha and to Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur's um, You cannot see the speaker on Zoom. Is that right? Yeah. Can you see me? Yeah. Anyway. Um, so, so, okay. So, so Sadhu Sangha is required to get what's called Nirguna Bhakti. Nirguna Bhakti is pure devotion. And Jiva Goswami and Vishwana Chakravati Thakur spends a lot of time explaining this idea of bhakti. At one point in the, in the uh, Madhuri Kadambani, Vishwanarbha Chakravataku says, Ko Varda. He says, What is the value without bhakti? So these three things you see sadhana, when you perform sadhana, or, you know, like, like we do sadhana every day. Somebody is doing gyan, his objective is to get liberation. Somebody is doing karma or activity is working, he wants to get swarga. Karma means doing dharma. And then that yogi has a result. He wants to go you know, get the salokya or samisti like that. But the glory of bhakti is given, um, you know, in Bhagavad Gita, mad bhakto, you know that verse, man manabhava, mad bhakto, mad yeji, mam naramamashu. This is the essence of what Bhagavad Gita is giving. So Srila Prabhupada has taken that essence in all his translations. So we don't accept these other points of views that, you know, trying to elevate karma or jnana and these are, these are pros. It's all a means to an end. Now, if you engage in bhakti, then jnana and vairagya is not beneficial. That's, that's, that's a bottom line fact. One who's given up all these dharmas and Krishna says, and he worships me, he is amongst the best of sadhus. Krishna is also saying that without bhakti or devotion, if you have birth in a high family, which is a result of karma, if you have shastric knowledge, uh, if you're chanting mantras and you perform austerity, it's just like decorating a dead body. This is what it says in the Hari Bhakti Sudaya. So it's like putting ornaments on a dead body. Bhakti is giving life. It's the life air of all sadhanas. Bhakti is not dependent on karma or jnana, but karma and jnana is dependent on bhakti. You have to really grasp that point. Somebody doing karma and jnana, doing austerity, you normally see they chant the names of Vishnu, etc. But bhakti doesn't need any aspect of karma and any aspect of gyan. So there's no mutual dependency. Even in your dream, it said, even in your dream, you should not think that there's some mutual independency between karma and gyan. So bhakti, just to recall, just to repeat, is independent because bhakti is of supreme power. It gives life to the other processes. It does not depend on purity. It does not depend on faith. Uh, it appears on its own. Bhakti is self-illuminating. So this criticisms that persons might have to Srila Prabhupada's version of Bhagavad Gita, with uh, you know where there's no bhakti and Srila Prabhupada is bringing in bhakti, actually Srila Prabhupada is bringing the essence of what Krishna is saying. Now you can go back, you can go all the way back and see what did Narada Muni say Vyasadeva? Vyasadeva compiled all these voluminous Vedas, so much of Vedas, the Mahabharata, etc. When Narada Muni came, Vyasadeva was extremely distressed. He wasn't feeling fulfilled. After having performed such you know, great service, he wasn't feeling fulfilled. What did Narada Muni say? He said, you glorified karma, Vyasadev. You glorified gyan. Uh, what is this dharma? Uh, that's why your heart is not satisfied because you have failed to bring out bhakti. That's the same thing Srila Prabhupada is doing in Bhagavad Gita. He is bringing out the bhakti. So even if a person is doing bhakti, like you and I practice bhakti every day, even if we don't complete it, we leave this world or something. 
still there's no misfortune because bhakti is of such eternal value. So Vyasadeva was told by Narada Muni that you are hiding the glory of bhakti. Even the Smriti Shastras, they say this, that karma yoga is dependent on time, you know, to do a yagya, a place, it has to be clean, the candidate has to be qualified, there has to be material in the performance, all of that has to be included. With bhakti, you don't need any of this thing. In karma, if you make a mistake, you have to do some prayas chata, you know, uh, to ask for forgiveness. Uh, in devotional service, like in the Vishnu Dharma, it said that in chanting the Lord's name, there is no restriction concerning the time, the place, the purity, the personality, the character of the person. Even in the state of total impurity, one can perform chanting Krishna's holy name. And we see this is being confirmed by Lord Jaitanya and the Shikshamrita, right? The second verse, that is the way it says there's no hard and fast rules. What is that verse? Oh my Lord, your holy name alone can render all benedictions to living beings. So you have hundreds and millions of names. And it goes on like that. But there are no hard and fast rules for chanting your name. So bhakti is not dependent on faith, believe it or not. It's not dependent on negligence. As not dependent on excellent performance. You take that rat, we just come out of Karatek. We all know that pastime where there's rats, uh, one whisker caught a light and he lit the wick, uh, the wick. And that that rat in his next life became a queen. Uh, that was not, the rat had no intention of performing bhakti, but he became a queen and he eventually got home to go back home, back to Godhead. So it got Sukriti. Like, you know, even if you commit offenses while doing while doing devotional service, for example, offenses are like wetness in wood. So the fire, when the fire is burning the wood, what does it do first? It absorbs the water, right? It dries the water, then it acts on the wood. So bhakti is like fire like that. It first kills, it'll kill the offense and it'll act like fire and eventually bestow all those vicious things. So bhakti done in, the, even you read sometime in the Madhurya Kadamini that there's terms like bhakti done in passion or in ignorance. Like if you're doing, like you're chanting Hare Krishna and you want to cause harm to somebody. That's a, that's a great apparat. But it doesn't affect the purity of bhakti. The acharyas explain like you take a crystal, you put it out there, it's pure, beautiful crystal. You put it on a blue cloth, what happens? The crystal takes on the color of the cloth. But the moment you move the blue cloth away, it's back to a crystal. So bhakti is like that. It might appear that it's got the modes of passion and ignorance, but bhakti in itself, the power of bhakti, that's the essence of what Krishna is saying in Bhagavad Gita. So for us to appreciate Krishna's words in Bhagavad Gita, we must have total faith and confidence that the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita, as Srila Prabhupada is presenting it, is that bhakti is the essence of everything. Now, Krishna says some very amazing things in Bhagavad Gita, as you know, right? When I first read Bhagavad Gita, I was just totally bowled over. And particularly in that 11th chapter where Krishna is saying that time I am, I'm the destroyer of everything. And how true is that? Look around us. Krishna, the form of time personified, he's telling Arjuna, my dear Arjuna, no one escapes my will. And you and I know that time, it reveals the ownership of everything. We may have a bond and document, a title deed in our name. When we are gone, what happens? It's time, although it's God's hands, Krishna's hands, that takes the life of each one of us. It causes our death. Time is not some, you know, uh, it's not some disease that causes our death. It's actually time. If you look at it uh, realistically, people identify with the apparent cause of death. But God's instrument, Krishna's instrument, they don't see that invisible, subtle energy at work. So Krishna is saying, Arjuna, my dear Arjuna, this time it's unceasing. It's all powerful under whose control world events occur. You put a pot of water, devotees, on the stove. But if there's no time, if there's, even if there's fire, and there's agni, if there's no kalpa, that time, that, that pot of water will never come to boil. You agree? Imagine that. How powerful this time factor is. It suspends everything. And Krishna is giving the secret that there may be, without time, there may be no moments, no hours, no days, no occasions, no seasons, no age. And we all take time for granted. 
when you stand in a river, river bed, the water goes past your feet. That water is gone forever. You can't, call, can you call back that water? You can't, nobody can. So like that time, it can't be reclaimed, can't be repurchased, can't be recycled, can't be stopped, it can't be fast forwarded, can't be rewinded. It's gone forever. So Krishna is saying, Arjuna, you be aware of this, Arjuna. And those who are born and those who are yet to be born, they will all die from the same disease of time. So if you understand your transient nature, that you are actually an eternal soul, Arjuna, but you will run out of time in this body because this body can only accommodate so many more time. So it rules, so time rules, you know, it rules the every atom, every star, the galaxy, etc. And it's Krishna's personal form in this world. Krishna is here in the form of time. So Manu Samhita says, time gone forever cannot be purchased or replaced. Now we find this kind of wisdom in Bhagavad Gita, isn't it? Krishna is talking about the nature of the soul, how it is eternal. Can you imagine the knowledge that Krishna is giving? He's saying something like, Krishna is saying that Arjuna, there's a subtle body, Bhumi, Apo, Analo, Vayu, that there's eight material elements of them, mind, subtle mind, intelligence, false ego. These things are not destroyed in the cremation chamber. The body is gone, Arjuna, but the soul is carrying these things to another body. Yeah? And you need to understand, like a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, the way we lead this life, that mind, you know, like you build a building, you need sand and stone, right? So the, the mind, which is subtle, the thoughts in the mind is the material that informs the next body. So Krishna is giving all of this knowledge in Bhagavad Gita, and he takes, he goes through all of this very, very systematically. In the middle of the Gita, he's giving devotional service. Then he's talking about the, uh, the modes of nature. How amazing is that chapter in Bhagavad Gita, the modes of nature? Who thinks about those kind of things? That it's modes of nature that impels you and I to move and to act. So in conclusion to this little introduction, Krishna's words are extremely powerful. They have been powerful. They will remain powerful for generations and you know, eons to come. So we who take the time to distribute these words, it's the most powerful act of devotion, Krishna says. You know, um, the other day, His Holiness Bhakti Chaitanya Mahaj was making this point that sometimes, you know, we stand in front of the deity and we pray to the deity, but the deity doesn't speak to us, does it? I don't know about you, but most certainly for me, I've been around for a long time. As whenever I'm at the temple, I speak to the deity, but it doesn't really talk to me, right? But Rupa Goswami and Sanatan Goswami, they can talk to the deity and chastise the deity, etc. Yet, by the mercy of the devotee, all of you on this call, if you give a Bhagavad Gita to somebody, like in the December book marathon, that somebody could be a very ordinary person on the street, totally, you know, unfamiliar with anything. Krishna speaks to that person from the pages of Bhagavad Gita. So Bhagavad Gita is the Vani of Krishna. We meet Lord Krishna in the pages of Bhagavad Gita. So by giving it to others, we are enabling Krishna to speak. And that's the greatest service to Bhagavad Gita. It is the greatest benevolent act, the greatest act of charity. And we, can re we may not even realize the significance of what we are doing when we distribute a book. You know, that it is indeed the highest welfare works, the highest prayer the highest yagya, it's the most attractive thing to Krishna, is a thing that pleases Krishna the most. So we are all very indebted to Srila Prabhupada for translating the Bhagavad Gita. We have a duty to study, like we have a little study group this evening. We're going to say a few things, we're going to answer some questions, help each other to appreciate Lord Krishna's words. We have a duty to master these 18 chapters, these 700 verses, and then we have a duty to share it. Srila Prabhupada, he was specially authorized. You know, we are Srila Prabhupada's descendants. It's our business to promote what he promoted. And thus, ourselves be promoted back to the lotus feet of Lord Sri Krishna. And you know, it says in the Bhakti Sandarbha, Jiva Goswami says that, that Krishna doesn't give bhakti to anyone. It's only the devotee. It's by the mercy of a devotee that bhakti appears in the heart of somebody. Or else if Krishna gives bhakti, then the question would be, then Krishna is impartial. How many devotees are on this call? How many people are in, you know, 
in the world. How many people are devotees? So why are they all not devotees? So it's the sadhu, the devotee from his heart. Bhakti is transplanted to the heart of another jiva. So the essence of Bhagavad Gita is understanding this idea of bhakti, that it is the indeed the only pathway back to Krishna's lotus feet, and that Lord Krishna is indeed controlled by the devotee, because that devotee is doing sadhana bhakti, which is sadhya bhakti, which is pure devotional service. This is in the 11th canto of Bhagavatam. So let me stop here, and let's discuss some aspects that you may have. If you have any questions, we can put them now and ask Srivas Prabhu to answer them for us. I hope you have some questions so we could have a nice discussion. Okay? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Prabhu, thank you. If there's any question, kindly unmute yourself. No questions, Hare Krishna. Somebody must have some question. Prabhu, there's no question. We can request uh, His Grace Mukunda Data Das to make a comment, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Please accept Muhammad obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, I was just listening to a lecture by Srila Prabhupada on the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1. Chapter 7, text 45 and 46, where he speaks about the Acharya, the Vedic scriptures, um, the spiritual master. And he says that the dogs will bark. Many people were uh, speaking ill about the scriptures in the past, about the gurus, about the, the Vedas. But Prabhupada said that these people have come and gone, and many other persons will come also. But the Vedas will continue. The, the dogs will bark but the caravan will continue. So whatever Srila Prabhupada is given as the Acharya, Sakcha Darid Venam, he's directly representing God. So whatever he presents is coming authorized from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And even if people speak ill and make their barking like dogs, the Vedic scriptures and the process that we've been given on Achavigra, worship of the deity and everything will continue. All we've got to do is remain chaste to what Srila Prabhupada has given us. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mukunda Prabhu. Shivas Prabhu, are you on the call? Do you want to make a comment? See, we have no questions. Sure. Hare Krishna, dear Govardhan Prabhu. Hare Krishna, devotees. Um, wonderful class. Thank you so much. Uh, always enlightening. Um, as as it may be a comment, um, in most cases, uh, when material or knowledge is given, the individual has to take that knowledge and try to match it in their lives and find out how is this applicable to me personally because mm. knowledge is given out in general and every statement that you made applies to someone in some way, in some form. And that's their own personal growth. And although there might not be questions uh, now, the question, the, the seeds for questions to come will be there. But I think what's, what's important uh, to understand about uh, the subject matter is that the purpose of our being here on, uh, on this planet and our, and our true identity is what needs to be understood because Kala is going to take that opportunity away from us. And that's what we need to understand. That's why the five topics that are covered based broadly or that are covered within the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains who he is, who you are, where you are, what does time have as an effect, and what's the effect of your actions. And most people go about their day-to-day -day activities um, wondering, why am I doing this? Is it just to pay the bills? Is it just to be just to take care of other individuals? No, that's not your primary responsibility. Like a drowning man, he should save himself first because he's no use to anyone else if he's going to be drowning, even though they're the family members. So in that sense, reading of the scripture elevates the consciousness so that you can elevate uh, other people's consciousness. And like you mentioned that um, bhakti comes only from the devotees. 
And that's why it's so important for the association of the devotees. And when the devotees speak and interact with each other, they share that bhakti that they have received through the parampara. And that's why Krishna also explains the importance of taking a guru to understand Shastra as well as to receive the bhakti. So that's why the bonified lines of Guru actually allow for bhakti to, to actually flourish. And that's why we see Srila Prabhupada's ISKCON flourishing because of that very same idea behind giving knowledge that he's actually experienced. Many other people may have knowledge, but they have not realized how it actually applies to them. In our sense, we have knowledge, we read of Prabhupada's activities, and that's why it's also so important to read how Prabhupada had behaved, how the Acharyas had behaved, and you can see the effect of Bhakti on them and also on the people that they interacted with. Many times we hear of people that have met Srila Prabhupada or have just walked across the doorway where Srila Prabhupada was giving a, uh, giving a lecture and 10, 15 years down the line, somehow or the other, they ended up chanting Hare Krishna and they in the movement. And when you hear the personal stories of each and every one of them, you understand, like in Damodar Asika, how Lord Damodar explains that he has uh, hundreds of pastimes, unlimited pastimes. He has unlimited pastimes himself and he has his pastimes with his devotees as well. That relationship that we share with him is unique to us. That's why they say when we go back to the spiritual world, we regain our original position in a Leela with Krishna. So if Krishna has to treat us roughly with his embrace, all that means is that we have actually have an opportunity to serve Krishna. Others may not have that and they do not understand how they do not relish the the benefit of actually experiencing bhakti and when when people understand oh no once i practice bhakti i can control krishna and some individual might say okay well if i can control god that's a good thing so let me try that but what you don't realize that bhakti actually softens your heart to a point where you realize what your true nature is and the blissful nature of actually being a servant here in this material world no one wants to be a servant Everyone wants to be the master. No one wants to listen. Everyone only wants to talk to. Everyone wants to be heard. But in this relationship, when we regain with Krishna, the blissful nature of it is explained so nicely by Srila Rupa Goswami. Uh, how he explains the unalloyed, abhilashita sunyam, that we need to, we have the knowledge, but we have to do the experiment. And this group that we have here today are the people that the devotees that are going to have to go and do that experiment. Once they do that experiment, like we do in class, these experiments, you come back and we, we compare notes. When we compare notes, we understand how bhakti has affected us and how it has actually benefited us. So I think maybe I can I'll stop there, but thank you so much. Govardhan uh, Prabhu, Hare Krishna. So, the, so there, was, there was a comment there about a, a friend who had lost his daughter and to say something about the soul, the individual fragmental soul. Um, can you say something about that, Shivas? To give some comfort to that person? Yeah, of, of recent, there's been a lot of uh, um, loss by many people, experienced by many people. And yes, it's very difficult because we have spent so much time with them. And of recent, I've also been to many uh, funerals as well, where individuals find it difficult to reconcile the loss. Um, the Bhagavad Gita, when it explains that time affects everyone, no one's immune, no one's immune to the effect of time. Uh, everyone, as soon as you are born, your clock starts ticking, your stopwatch, and at some point in time, everyone's watch, it will stop. That's how Krishna explains it. However, what benefit can we actually give that person which we, say, which we had shared such a bond with is the question we can ask ourselves. Because now the person is no longer physically visible in our presence. But that's why Krishna explains within the Bhagavad Gita what we can actually do to give benefit to the soul. So when we, when we offer food, when we, we, when we chant loudly in the house, when we read out Bhagavad Gita, 
those souls that have not yet passed over actually still get benefit. So in that way we can actually help the souls that have departed from the body and give them instruction further to for on their journey moving further. Like I said, it is difficult and it is it is always a somber moment. Um, I remember uh, at a point in time uh, the devotees were around me when I had when my father had left his body and I was actually every every devotee hopes that at what you think of the time of death you shall attain my father in a person in a in a personal explanation was was actually benefited from the fact that he had passed on while in my arms as I was chanting the holy name in his ears so in that sense we understood at the time of death what's beneficial and that's done but for for those that have not it's also no problem because you can still continue chanting you can still continue offering prayers for the benefit of that soul and in that way allow the soul to to progress spiritually or elevate so thank you yeah so Prabhuji who asked that question maybe you could explain to your friend like the nature of the soul a bit more <clears throat> Like the soul is encased in this temporary material body. Each soul has always existed. And it will continue. That person who we have known, that soul that is gone, will remain an individual soul. Um, so it's God's superior energy in chapter 7, Krishna is saying, text 5. Therefore, it never dies. It can't be burnt, Krishna is saying in chapter 2. I think it's verses 16 and 21. So that soul um, is a person. It's purusha. Some or the other, now it's covered. So it's got to shed those layers of illusion. Uh, you have to remove those layers of illusion to uncover the true self. Anything valuable, you got to you got to you got to work at it. So by uncovering all of these layers, you come to the true self. The ever-changing material body, and there's eight million four hundred thousand types of these bodies that covers the soul in each of those biological forms of life. So body is in a biological flux. The birth and death is symptomatic of that biological cycle from one form to the other. And Krishna is even saying in the Gita that the body is like the field on which we play our life. Uh, and the soul is a witness of that field. So the changing body, it affects our consciousness on varying levels, depends what consciousness we have. Yet we can never alter the soul's eternal nature. So if your friend, somebody other, if you had an opportunity to sit down and explain to him or her that this soul is indestructible, that person that you, that you knew, the casing has been removed, the body has been removed. Like when you say, I was a child, I being what? The core self, right? It's the same constant person. Even as the body and mind changes, the, the enduring eye, that, that, that spirit soul, which wears that mortal body, that remains. When we complete our tenure in this body, we have a limited breath. Actually, it says in the Vedas, you're given so many breaths in each lifetime. When those breaths expire, everything expires in this world. Everything, everything in this material world expires except the soul. Soul has got no uh, expired date. It moves on to his next body. So we do this with full power to influence what that other body would be. So in the full spectrum of uh, what is available, we get a body of the lowest or the highest in Vaikuntha. That choice is actually our choice. So now that our family member has, has left and we feel great uh, you know, separation, we're confronted with the kind of metaphysical things about life because we realize that could happen to us one day, particularly in the human form of life. An animal doesn't think about karmic hierarchy in any way. So as I give up old clothes, I change my coat. I also change my body. It's natural. Uh, the body is just a garb for that soul. The paradox or the irony of material life is that, you know, for all our vanity and our pride, we actually underestimate our real self. We think, uh, we think ourselves as mortal. And when in fact we are immortal, we are in fact eternally, we are in fact ever joyful, we are in fact full of knowledge, such ananda. We need only reclaim that appropriately. So Krishna in the words of, in the Bhagavad Gita, 
particularly in the sixth chapter. I think it's verses 20, Shivas. That's where he's saying these kind of things, that we've forgotten our eternal spiritual pedigree. Eternal spiritual pedigree. How beautiful is that? That we are super beings. We are not subject to death. We are not subject to deterioration, for example. Not even a single thing we measure that is matter. In matter, everything perishes, like paint perishes, beauty perishes. But subtle things like reputation, sadness, these things, you, know, you go to somebody's funeral and they say, you're such a kind person, etc." Et Those subtle things, they, 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 they survive. So things more subtle than that, like the mind, intelligence, and the soul, can you imagine? If reputation and remembrance of somebody will survive those things, you know, uh, Krishna says they, 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 they are there forever. So we are clinging to this fleeting material things. Uh, you know, it's so fleeting. In other words, that eternal being, you and I, some or the other, you know, we are foolishly grasping at the temporary impermanent things with no evidence that its possession can take us beyond the grave or crematorium. My great grandfather has died. Grandfather has died in the Mahabharat. Yudhisthira Maharaj has asked this question. What is the most amazing thing? He says, the most amazing thing is that my great grandfather's died. Grandfather's died. I think I am never going to die. I say, it's only the desire, this karmic actions, level of consciousness, all subtle and invisible elements that truly survives death. So Prabhuji, I, I would suggest that read chapter two with your friend. So these truths, you know, there's hundreds of desire chains in our body and it imprisons the soul. These desire chains imprison the soul, which seeks lordship in this world. Even a pious person is bound by his mundane work. So we fall into duality, uh, illusion, desire, aversion. It overcomes us. For one who's trapped in these dualities, what happens? Desire and aversion is there. So our, our, our current state of mind, it arouses desires and aversion. We get trapped in joy and sorrow. When somebody leaves, it's a devastating, and naturally so, because we've known that person for such a long time and we love and care for that person. But we have to accept that our, presently our material desires um, conceal our true awareness. And that's in chapter three of Bhagavad Gita. Thus, by our personal choice to accept or reject spiritual life, we act as our own friend or our own enemy. We alone can degrade, or we alone can elevate ourselves. The Lord does not force us to do any of this, good or evil. We have free will. There's no evil. I mean, like, you know, we say in the sun planet, there's the sun. There's no shadow. But you stand in front of the sun. Immediately you stand in front of the sun, you create a shadow. So who's creating the evil? Who's creating the shadow? It's our actions, our activities. So Arjuna is being told all of this on the battlefield. Uh, you know, be careful that this material nature doesn't seduce you. <laughs> and imprison you to the modes of nature, we actually start thinking that this world is real. So there you see in the Gita, Prabhuji, who have asked that question, the Krishna talks about this individual soul. He talks about the jiva. He talks about Bhuta. He talks about Bhutani, plural, where Krishna is never referred in the Gita as Bhuta. Why? Because Bhuta comes, is the verbal root of Bhu, B-H-U, which means to be or become. So Buddha could mean one who has come to being, come into being, but both the soul and God has never come into being. They have been, never was there a time when I do not exist, Krishna is saying, no, you know, all these friends, never in the future shall any of us ever cease to be. So Prabhuji, I mean, you know, we can take it offline a bit more to give a bit more practical essence to what I'm saying, uh, but ultimately that transcendental knowledge might give your friend some peace of mind to know that, really speaking, his daughter has not really passed away. She just moved to another state of existence. The Gita calls the soul uh, as Jiva Bhuta two times. It's a very important, I mean, Krishna spent a lot of time to explain this to Arjuna because that was Arjuna's doubt, you know? Yeah. You know, uh, Jiva Goswami, if you read Paramatma Sandarbha, not to get technical, I'll make a quick statement about it. He says there that the soul is accounted amongst the associates of the super soul. That the soul is full of knowledge, it's virtuous, it's beyond the touch of matter. It's unborn, it's not only unchanging, it's naturally situated in, on its spiritual platform. It's atomic in size, it's all pervading within the material body, yet we don't perceive its existence. 
is full of spiritual bliss, it's separate and it's a distinct person. So his daughter is a distinct person. She's unchanging. She's the knower of the field of whatever goes on in her field of activities. She's eternal. She can't be burnt, can't be moistened, withered, water, killed. That soul, whether it's a demigod or a human being or an animal or unmoving plant, uh, you know, is not subject to the change that matter imposes. Matter that we see here has got the temporary transient thing, but the soul is, that's all pervading. It's, it's, it's manifest. It means the power to manifest things before himself. Like you perceive a, your sense of, say you see a clay pot, you can perceive that. But the soul, it's very hard to perceive it if you don't have knowledge. You know, your mind and intelligence sometimes, you know, the mind and intelligence is not the anatomy of the human body, right? My hand is the anatomy of my body. I can eat with it, I can fight with it. But if, I, if you ask me my mind and intelligence, there's no organ in the body. So scientists don't know, they can't find these things. <laughs> they can't find. The consciousness which pervades the body is a symptom of the soul. So Prabhuji, explain that, see how it goes. And if, if some comfort doesn't come uh, through that, then we can have more discussion and you know, um, see how you can help your friend become more peaceful. Is there uh, another question or comment? I think while, while we're waiting, Govardhan Prabhu, um, I think it was mentioned also that uh, the person is not a devotee and uh, it's a first exposure to Krishna consciousness. Oh, okay, okay. And so I think yes. in that perspective, All right. uh, it okay. has to be brought down yeah. a little bit more on a, a level of tangible understanding. That's where, it. Where, 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 I mean, for, from that perspective, yes. if you ask the individual, if you take the, your daughter's photo from the age of six and the age of 12, you know, there's obviously mm. some change, but your daughter is still the same person, you know, yes. in the same way we can understand the change of God, you know, although we bring into the metaphysical, um, that understanding of what happens beyond that can be explained, I guess, you know, with, with the reading as Krishna explains that the soul never dies and uh, it, by, by the actions and its karma, it accepts a particular type of nose, a particular type of ear and so on. And in that way, we can understand that what we are doing in this life is actually creating our form for the next life. Yes. And that way we should be mindful of how we behave uh, because uh, Shastra explains that and the Bhagavad, and Bhagavad Gita elaborates on the fact that one who be behaves in a certain way um, will attain the body of a, a being that has those tendencies. That is why we try to promote uh, Brahmanical spiritual activity so that we uh, become Aham Brahmasmi. We regain, we regain our spiritual consciousness and we live uh, in, in a space that's uh, Satchidananda, you know, eternal right. full of knowledge and bliss. So, yeah, I think maybe from, from a. Yeah, yeah. Of... So, what you could say, Shiva, so uh, probably you asked that question, our guest on the call today. And now that the soul is gone, so you can ask, what can we do for that person who left? So the Shastra says a couple of things. Like you can plant a fruit tree on a temple ground. So those fruits will be offered to Krishna and that soul will make a tangible advancement. On the anniversary death day of the, of the person who passed away, in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna refers to this pinda. You can offer some you know, food to Krishna, to Lord Krishna, offer it in a, you know, in a uh, way it's normally offered. And then you could take a little bit of the food that you've offered, put it into another plate and offer it to a picture of the deceased person. So that soul now gets to make, we see what actually happens when somebody leaves this body. They, they either gone to another birth or we don't know what their destination is. But the scripture also says that 21 generations of devotees, this is a discussion between Prahlad and Lord Nishingadev, that 21 generations will get liberated. So the other thing we could do is that we try and become a, an advanced and pure devotee. So we can be assured that she will get the benefit of our devotion. So you can plant a fruit tree. Of all of these activities that you can do, the scripture ultimately says that the best thing you can do is to offer a sacred scripture. In other words, you take a take a you know any one of sacred Vedic texts, and you offer it. In, in other words, you you sponsor it or distribute it in that person's name, 
And the authority for this comes from Bhagavad Gita, Nachatas man manus yeshu, kaschin me praya krit manaha. That there is no servant in this world, Krishna is saying, that's more dear to me than he, nor will there ever be anyone more dear to me. That's somebody who does this. So if we want to benefit the person who left, we can sponsor or get some scripture, Vedic, particularly Srila Prabhupada's books, given out as Shastra Dan to somebody in her name. So those are some practical things we can do. I, I hope that helps you a little bit, Prabhupada. Yeah, Govardhan Prabhupada, so, as, as you're mentioning as well, while we wait for questions, uh, if there is a reply, uh, please please do come in uh, because we we are work, we're having sort of a discussion so individuals that want to come in to discuss please do so because the subject matter has to be uh, realized or put in place within our daily lives so that we can understand how to execute the, the knowledge that we are receiving otherwise it, it does not have the benefit if we, we do not practice we do not bring it into our daily practice or what we refer to as sadhana. Um, when, you, when you're mentioning uh, uh, the, the fact of death and the helplessness of an individual when he loses someone close to them, so to, to them with, in a relationship of whatever kind, as, as you grow with your understanding of spirituality, you understand how to give benefit to yourself as well as to others before that time comes where you cannot do anything or have very little to offer. So in this sense, like when Govardhan Prabhu is mentioning all the different ways, it's not only at the time of death or after the person has have left the body, all of those things can be done there, but now that you know it, it can be done for any of the individuals before they even come to that point. And that's why it's so important to distribute Srila Prabhupada's books to help them because if you really want to understand, everyone wants to give the perfect gift to, the per to, the, to their loved ones. What, what would give them the most benefit? But ultimately we know every material thing that we give them has, would be used and discarded at some point. What you can give is an eternal gift, a gift that continues giving when they pass it on as well as help them. So when we distribute Srila Prabhupada's books, that actually helps us as well as them because we are giving them an eternal gift, not a temporary gift. So as we go into our December marathon, um, everyone should try to get hold of uh, their local temples and uh, keep a few books in their car. Um, and people that we'd meet, you can hand out those books to them because if you really want to uh, help society at large, there's no need to become a counselor or a politician because that's not really going to give much benefit. Um, if you want to, uh, distribute Srila Prabhupada's books, give them eternal benefit, give the family solace, give them understanding so that at the time of death, that which you, which you think about, you shall attain, as Krishna speaks in the Bhagavad Gita. And in that way, that's the, the best gift that you can give your loved ones. Thank you, Govardhan Prabhu. Hare Krishna. So, Paramatma Prabhu, instruct me, what should we do now? Hare Krishna Prabhu. Prabhu, I just got a quick question, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Now, Prabhu, the Bhagavad Gita, it mentions that uh, the Bhagavad Gita, Gita was first spoken by the Sun God. So, after the Sun God spoke, and also, um, Vaya Samani spoke the Bhagavad Gita to Sanjaya, and the Bhagavad Gita was also then spoken to Arjuna. Uh, so I just wanted to know, and also it was spoken to Dashtrashtra as well, you know, from Sanjaya to Dashtrashtra. I wanted to know from all of them that heard the Bhagavad Gita, how did it change them? Or did it even change all of them? Or, or if it didn't, why, you know? And also how did the Bhagavad Gita get lost from the sun god and they eventually got to Arjuna? What was the reason for that uh, loss? Right. Oh, so stay, 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 then, yeah. okay, stay in the fourth chapter. She was okay. you want to give a comment on that? Uh, maybe while you're looking it, looking for it in the fourth chapter, um, if you you know the 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 end of um, the Mahabharat when after Sanjay had spoken to Dhritarashtra, he had gave further instructions, and at that point Dhritarashtra knew what he had to do uh, when everything was concluded. He 
he had taken himself and his wife and he went to perform the austerities that were needed to actually uh, exit the world in the timeliest way. So he understood the instruction and that instructions that were reiterated, reiterated was, was then executed by him towards the, the last part of his life. So they did, he did get the benefit of, uh, of uh, hearing Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. Paramatma, is I mean, is that uh, is it okay? Yes, I was, it's okay. Thank you so much. And I also wanted to know about the sun god as well. He said he's spoken to Arjuna and got lost. Now, how did, how come it got lost in the first place? Um, the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. So, so the sun god is Vivashvan Krishna. Is Imam Vivashvate Yogam Pratavan Aham Ave. That's the verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna mm -hmm. saying, "I've first spoken this imperishable science to the sun god Vivashvan, who then." Um, you know, spoke, spoke to Manu, etc. So, because of the long expanses of time, mm -hmm. uh, because it's an oral tradition, it's not a written down tradition. So, when the disciplic succession, uh, you know, breaks, then Krishna has to come and re-speak it to re-establish it. Mm -hmm. In the case of in the case of um, Vyasadev, he gave he gave special ability because remember Sanjaya was speaking to a blind king. The, the king quite clearly and Sanjay were not close to the battlefield, but mm -hmm. Sanjay had the special ability that he could hear and know everything that's going on, even in the minds of all those soldiers, because he was a mm -hmm. disciple of Vyasadeva. That's like a transcendental satellite. Uh, so, I mean, in the future, the scriptures that we can remember, scriptures are eternal. They're not created. Mm -hmm. they, they, they eternally exist as personalities in the spiritual world. So as the afflux of time, this, you know, knowledge is lost. Like if you take the Puranas, not all the Puranas are on this earth planet. And Jiva Goswami says in Tattva Sandarbha, establish a Srimad Bhagavatam as the ultimate Purana because it's available. It's one of the reasons mm -hmm. he gives. So like that, with the afflux of time, things appear and disappear. And Krishna, through the disciplic succession, tries to keep the knowledge in human society so human society can benefit and go back. Mm -hmm you know, back to the kingdom of God, yeah. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Governor Prabhu. I think there's a very nice question that just asked. Uh, if uh, Prabhu can read it out for the benefit of everyone. Can the moderator please read out the question? Oh, Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Sorry. Hare Krishna is from Bhagavad Das to everyone. Hare Krishna, thank you for such an informative class. My daughter Tarisha wants to know if it's because we might have done good and bad in our past lives is the reason why we have been reborn into this world and into a devotee family. Yes, that's exactly it. It's because of our karma, good or bad karma. Good or bad karma creates the embodiment. We embody it because of good or bad karma. Because if you have good karma, you, you got to go to the higher planets, the heavenly planets, to trade off or live out that, you know, the heavenly life. And when it's finished, you come back here. Yeah, Brahma, Bhuvana, Loka, Krishna says. From the highest planet of the material world to the lowest is place of birth and death. So the idea is uh, because it, 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 it's not to develop good karma. The idea is to develop devotion. Because devotion will stop the repeated birth and death. Good karma won't. So it is, we're born in an aristocratic family in a particular area, in a particular part of the world. It's all very subtly arranged. Nothing is by chance in the particular body we take. And the only thing we have control over is because we have free will. You see, you can't force somebody to love. Huh? So Krishna doesn't force anyone to love him. Uh, what does Krishna do? He, uh, he, um, he gives you free will. So you can choose to serve him or not to serve him. So if you choose to serve him, develop love, then our pathway back to Krishna is opened and we start that journey. Like when you say somebody, pull the ropes of the Ratha chariot, you go back. Well, you don't literally mean that. What you're saying to the person is that when you touch those ropes, your journey has begun. Your devotional creeper has started. There's an ignition there. Because to go back to Krishna is no ordinary thing. You accept a bona fide spiritual master coming in disciplic succession. You serve him and serve the devotees, and you're serving Krishna. In that way, you can be assured of going back home, back to Godhead. Thank you, 
Yeah. Barak of approval, I hope that is okay. Go ahead and approve. Um, just maybe to also uh, um, add to the question. So there's the karmic part that allows one of either four benefits, whether you're born in an aristocratic family, whether you have, you're born with uh, good physical features, whether you're born with intelligence, whether you're born in uh, uh, as such, you know, with, with the benefits of karma. But when it comes to a, an individual that's born within a family of Vaishnavs, that is not quite necess necessarily in the realm of good karma uh, when they have an opportunity to continue where they've left off with the spiritual uh, um, practices because they might not have completed in the previous life. So when uh, that's why when, uh, when there's Vaishnav families and you have uh, children that are born as Vaishnavs, they are coming to complete the last bit of their um, spiritual development uh, so that they can go back to God. Um, so I think uh, maybe if you can also elaborate on, I think those two aspects of just a karma part and a devotee, because I think the question also refers to a person born in a devotee family. Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains in the Jaiva Dharma that, you know, like, you know, like, what to speak of devotee family, speak of Vaishya, Sudra, Kshatriya and Brahmin. Bhakti Mataku says in Kali Yuga, there's no such thing. Uh, as a matter of fact, he says, the village elders must get together. They must interview the child, see what the child's disposition is. And then the child must write a test when the child is 15 years old or something. And if the child fails the test and two years later, you must give the child a test again. Then you tell the child, you are a Brahmin, Vaishya, Sudra, or Kshatriya. He doesn't say, birth doesn't differentiate your your Varna or your Ashram. So in Kali Yuga, it's really because to be born in a Brahmin, as a Brahmin, it means you have performed all the Garbhadhan samskaras. And that, it says you have to have done that for like many generations before. So Kali Yuga is just a totally messed up place. And therefore, that even if somebody is born, like sometimes you may have a devotee and a demon in the same body. In the previous lives, you get them in different planets. Now <laughs> they could be in the same body. You may have some experience about that, huh? So the, the, our, only our only shelter is the Krishna's holy name, actually. If some of the other, we're chanting Krishna's holy name and liberate ourselves, then we can go back. But where we are here now, we can't say, you know, who's coming from where and, uh, you know, there's so many caste Brahmins who claim uh, they are Brahmin because their father is Brahmin. But you know, Taco rejects all of that. So some of the other, if our children and ourselves have access to the association of devotees and chanting Hare Krishna and eating Krishna Prashad, uh, it's the most glorious thing. That's the most glorious thing you can ever give to a child because that means you're winding up everything in the samsara world that's coming to an end. So Paramatma Prabhu is getting pretty late, right? We have guests on yeah, the call. Yeah, so thank you so much for the wonderful class and thank you to first yeah. three of us, Pandit Prabhu, for the nice... Uh, support and answering all the nice questions. Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank you. All glories um, to you, all glories to all the devotees, all glories to Prabhupada. Thank you so much. And and, and the, the BBT books, ISKCON books, Bhagavad Gita books are all available on takealot.com. It's under Bhakti books. So you're welcome to audit online as well. Prabhu, thank you so much. If there's any more uh, closing comments from yourself. Yeah, I'm just very happy to be with you. I'm very happy. Thank Do you. you have these calls every day? Or? Uh, which calls, Prabhu? Do you have these calls that you're having today, this discussion every day with devotees? Well, we're trying to Prabhu, to get everyone inspired, you know? Okay. Yeah, you know, I, think that, I, think, I think that I understand what happens at death and what happens, you know, to the soul that leaves and that those souls are not in devotional line, going to Yamaraj and Pind. You, you might want to convene a topic like that because it's, it's, yes, it's a yes. subject of it's, it's a subject of interest you know okay because like like you know uh, i mean bhagavad gita it can get so technical and we have guests on the call we may we may lose them and it's very important to open up something more general it's understanding karma or understanding what those next steps are and i'm sure shivas or somebody else would even i if we've got to find the time we're very happy to have a conversation what exactly happens from the time the soul leaves the body, what happens to the subtle body, what happens to the soul, it's definitely something beyond the crematorium. 
Now we've got to take Krishna's words for that and then see what happens. How to exit this world gracefully. Thank you, Paramatma Prabhu. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Please accept my humble obeisances of the Chair Prabhupada. Prabhu, normally yeah. we have Kirtan and Yen together. Please close up with some Kirtan. We really appreciate it. Yeah, we can do that. What Kirtan should we sing? Up to you, Prabhu. <laughs> and we hope we can yeah. have you again on our, on our program, Prabhu, and, and we can help His Grace to us fund it as well. Prabhu, please, you can join us. Really appreciate it. So nice to get yeah. your people on online. Yeah. Well, I, I'm concerned that we may not have adequately address the question the devotee our, our guest yes. was asking you know and um okay because you know death is so painful it says in the shasta it's like forty thousand scorpions biting you so it's a very difficult thing mrittu sarva haras cham krishna says i'm all devouring death so i i, I just thinking while well, you know while, while you said that i want to just give our guest one comfort before we see kids and just for 30 seconds you know it stated that uh, a mouse in the mouth of a cat is terrified. But the same mouth of death that carries the kitten is a different experience. So for a devotional person, the mouth is like a kitten, tender, passing with full understanding, life beyond death. But for somebody not in devotional line, it could be as terrifying as a mouse in the mouth of a cat. So that knowledge is something we, you know, we, must, we must try and acquire. So let's chant. Uh, what should we chant? I have a harmonium, actually. Hey, you're welcome, Prabhu. Thank you so much. Well, I, so try. I, you. I got a harmonium, yeah. I could definitely do something. Uh, Prabhu, by the way, is that your, is that, are you in your house? Is that your library behind you? Yes. Wow, that's the a big collection you have. Yeah. Let's see if this works. Can you hear me? Yes, Can Prabhu, you hear that? Yes, can you hear the yes. harmonium? Yes, can you hear Prabhu. the harmonium? Yes, Prabhu. You can hear the harmonium? Yes, Prabhu. Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Rama. Rama Stena Rasi Rama, Rama 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 Ilatanga Mikalaye Itoni Shingo Paratoni Shingo Yetu Yetu Yamita Tony Shinga Dahe Shinga Dahe Shingo Shinga Martin Sadana Kapadai Baba Tara Kamala Bhavi Nakama Dhuta Shinga Dalita Hiranaka Shipu Tanu Bhingam Kesavadita Narahari Rupa Jaya Jagadisha Hare Jaya Jagadish Hare Jaya Jagadish Hare Jaya Shinga De Jaya Shinga De Shinga De Jaya Shinga De Jaya Pralad Mara Jaya Pralad Mara 
ಜಯ ಪ್ರಯ ಪ್ರಭು ಪದ ಪ್ರಭು ಪದ ಜಯ ಪ್ರಭು ಪದ ಪ್ರಭು ಪದ ಈಚಾಯ ಗುರ ಹರಿವ ಹರಿವ ಗುರ ಹರಿವ ಜಯ ಓಂ ವಿಶ್ವಪರಮಹಂಸ ಪರಿವಚಕಚಾರ್ಯ ಅಷ್ಟೋರಿ ಸರಸತ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀಮಾನ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿವೈನ್ ಇನ್ ಲವಿಂಗ್ ವೇ ಶ್ರೇಷ್ಠ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇ ದಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಗುರು ಭಾರಿ ಕೀಚ ಆನಂದ ಕೋತಿ ವೈಷ್ಣವ ವೃಂದ ಕೀಚ ನಾಮಚಾರ್ಯ ಶ್ರೀಹರಿದಾಸ ಪ್ರೇಮ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರು ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಭಗವಂತಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧಾರ ಶಿವ ಶ್ರೀ ಗೋರು ಭಕ್ತಿ ಶ್ರೀ ರಾಧಾ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಗೋಪ ಗೋಪಿನಾಥ ಶ್ಯಾಮ ಕುಂದ ರಾಧ ಕುಂದ ಗಿರಿ ಗೋವರ್ಧಾನ ಭಜ ಭೂಮಿ ಶ್ರೀ ಬೃಂದಾವನ ಕೀ ಜ ನವದೀಪ ಮಾಯಪುರ ಧಾಮ ಕೀ ಜ ನೀಲ ಚಲ ಜಗನ್ನಾಥ ಕವಿ ಧಾಮ ಸಾಯಿ ಗೋಪಮಾನಿ ಹರಿ ಗೋ ಹರಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಜಾಯ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸೋ ಮಚ್ ಹರಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ thank you paramatma ji thank you sir ma'am thank you sir ma'am please all guys sir thank you so much oh, for glorious day, wonderful krishna. service hari krishna hari krishna devotees hari krishna hari krishna devotees